Buenas tardes a todos. En realidad no sería necesario que presentase mucho a Gerent Paul Ries hoy porque le conocemos muy bien la mayoría de nosotros. Hizo la tesis en Infolex dirigida por Janet de Césaris, que también está aquí. Hola Janet, ya te hemos dicho ahora antes. Eh, Gerent es investigador eh, sobre lexicografía basada en corpus y escritura académica en la Universidad de Sarri. Y también es profesor asociado en la Universidad Pompeu Fabra porque se acaba de, bueno, de hecho se ha unido hace poquito, ¿no? Este mismo mes, me parece, que ha empezado a ser eh, profesor asociado en el Departamento de Traducción y, y, y Ciencias del Lenguaje. Y su investigación se centra en la lingüística de corpus, la lexicografía, la adquisición de vocabulario y las tecnologías de aprendizaje. Ahora mismo está trabajando en estos temas y nos va a hablar de la herramienta Colocate y yo creo que no, creo que no hay mucho más que decir de Gren porque le conocemos bien, pero si alguien quiere añadir algo, pues adelante. Si no, Geren, cuando quieras puedes empezar. Perfecto, muchas gracias Blanca y gracias por la invitación. Me alegra mucho estar aquí con ustedes otra vez. Um, hablaré en, en inglés, pero si hay preguntas al final en castellano o catalán, uh, con vulgo. Vale. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a writing tool, a project to develop an academic writing assistant uh, called Collocate. Uh, to give you a brief overview of the presentation, uh, can you see my screen? Okay. No, I don't know. No, I don't know. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Odyssey? Sí. Odyssey. Sí, Odyssey. Perfect. Uh, technology. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about Collocate, um, an academic writing assistant, assistant uh, which is a project I've been involved in at the University of Surrey for around four years now. Um, for the presentation, I'll give you some background to the tool. I'll go over the rationale underlying it. Uh, I'll give a quick demo before going through some of the lessons learned, and then reflect about the impact and the opportunities for further research. So what is Collocate? Well, um, I'm sure from the title of the presentation, you probably gathered it as something to do with collocation and understood here in the Neo-Firthian sense of uh, words occurring together with a frequency greater than the law of averages would lead you to expect. Now there's an, another element aid, so aid in the sense of helping people, helping people with academic writing, making it easier for academic writers. So the third element is academic writing. It's a text editing tool to help academic writers find the collocation they need as they write. Uh, this involves the visualization of lexicographic data and it's an interdisciplinary effort. Um, it involves researching human computer interaction and compiling a large database of collocation suggestions. So it's a collaborative effort. Uh, it was funded by the UK, it is funded by the UK Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, initially for 36 months, and then with some individual funding, uh, some uh, an extension, sorry. I, I must stress that this, is re this really is a team effort and that the initial idea and and it's, a, it's the brainchild, if you will, of Dr. Anna Frankenberg Garcia, who's with us today. Hello, Anna. Uh, we also have co-investigators based in Poznan, Dr. Robert, uh, Robert Liu, and Professor Jonathan Roberts based in Bangor. There were uh, two postdoctoral researchers, um, myself at Surrey, dealing with lexicography, and the doctors, uh, Nivan Sharma and Peter Butcher at Bangor in Wales, uh, who, uh, who dealt with the HCI side. Mm. So why develop collocate? Well, collocation, it goes without saying that collocation is important in academic writing, helps make text more readable. Uh, 
it's pretty uncontroversial to say that strong collocations are processed faster than weaker combinations with comparable meaning. There's lots of studies backing this up. And collocations also have another role, and that's marking the writer out as a member of a discourse community. I'm sure you've all read or reviewed papers where you would probably agreed with the content, but something about the language wasn't quite right. Um, something didn't sit well, and usually these problems are to do with collocations. Collocations also account for a large proportion of errors in language. Uh, for example, there's lots of studies on learner corpora, so these are corpora of text written by learners of English or other languages. Uh, we've recently released a database of um, some of the salient errors related to collocation that we found in these corpora. But that's not to say that native speaker status is the be all and end all when it comes to uh, mastery of collocation. Anna has done some research where she found that experienced with academic language rather than native speaker status was key to mastery of academic collocations. It's often said that there are no um, native speakers of academic English. Um, and I think this research uh, bears that out. She established that academics, experienced academics could recall a greater number of strong collocations than students just starting out in their academic careers. And that amongst experienced academics, there was greater um, agreement on what constituted a collocation and what, if you want, was just a freer combination. So it goes without saying then that EAP writers need help with collocation. Incidental learning from reading is not enough and lexicographic resources have an important role to play, uh, principally in written production. So there are lots of exi existing resources to help with collocations. We've got good old fashioned dictionaries. Um, Dictionaries, especially monolingual learners dictionaries, have, since the times of Hornby, have put a, a lot of emphasis on collocations. You can see here, this is a screenshot from Macmillan. Um, more recently in Macmillan, they've added this um, explore collocations features. This was added last year. There are specialized collocation dictionaries, some of which uh, contain lists which put specific emphasis on academic collocations. And of course, there are textbooks specifically dealing with uh, academic collocations and academic lexics. And this speaks to the size of the market for these kind of resources and for English for academic purposes courses and the amount of people who are learning English for academic pur purposes. There are also specific EAP dictionaries. For example, the Louvain EAP dictionary, which puts um, a great emphasis on collocations. I don't know if you can see in this screenshot on the, on the right-hand side there. There are also EAP dictionaries from more established publishers. Again, a great emphasis on collocations. Um, a lot of, but you've got to do a lot of searching through the microstructure to get there. More adventurous users could go directly to the corpora. Uh, this is a screenshot of the co collocates for uh, the collocates for research as a noun in Coca, the contemporary corpus of American English. And there are tools which make corpus search a little bit easier, such as Sketch Engine for language learners. And this is really great. This shows um, collocates for research. Um, this shows collocates for research, but the problem is uh, this is not specifically dealing with academic language. Another resource is the Flax Learning Collocations Library. Um, this does deal with academic language and has the added advantage of being able to um, to filter for different disciplines. For example, this is showing collocates for research in the physical sciences. So if we have all of these resources, why are we developing collocate? Why have we developed collocate? Well, 
Dictionaries are great. I'm, I'm not here to bash dictionaries, but dictionaries may not have enough contextual information. Uh, for example, examples, um, especially those from academic language. Collocation information is often hidden away at the end of an entry, sometimes very difficult to find. And really, to use a dictionary effectively, training is needed. So EAP textbooks are great to someone who taught um, an EAP course last semester. These are really useful, great resource in the EAP classroom, but not practical, really, I think, at the moment of writing a research paper, especially for more established researchers. Corporate are great. There's loads of information out there. Things are have got much easier, they're much easier to use. However, training is needed and many interfaces are still not particularly user friendly. Uh, it took, I hadn't used the COCA interface since they'd um, redeveloped it and it took me 15 minutes to work out how to take the last screenshot I showed you. Um, building queries isn't so intuitive. You have to know at least a little bit of regex. Um, and of course, there's no filter. We don't, we can't really control what comes out. Concordances that users latch onto could be non-standard or inappropriate. It's really easy to misinterpret the data and it's really easy to get distracted by the data if you read something interesting and then just go down the rabbit hole of investigating what you've read in the corpus line. So um, as for, um, misinterpreting the data. I love this example from Hilary Nessie, and she cites an example that was in the uh, Long Run Dictionary of Contemporary English, the first edition, and it states that it was the managing director who perpetuated the frightful statue. So it's an example for the verb perpetuate, and she shows that this caused the user to write, I perpetuated a painting. So it's easy to see how users without training can misinterpret data from corpus lines. So to sum up, dictionaries and corporate are useful, but users have to stop writing to consult their references, which can really interrupt the flow. This is particularly um, problematic in cognitively demanding tasks such as academic writing. Really when you're writing a paper or, write, or, or writing, I don't know, a thesis, you want to get your ideas down on paper or down on the screen uh, without having to worry about the language, without having to go to a web browser, open a window, get distracted by the adverts. Um, you really just want to concentrate on the task at hand. So this other problem is that writers will not look up collocations if they're not aware of the collocation problems. It's that great question in research. How do you account for silences in data? How can you become aware of something if you don't know there's a gap in your knowledge? And Anna has done some research which suggests that uh, users tend to overestimate their knowledge um, of collocation. So this is particularly a particularly pertinent point. So what's different about Collocate? Well, it can help users expand their repertoire of academic collocation. It gives collocation reminders in real time Writers can access collocations they might not otherwise not remember to use. It can just act as a, a little prompt, I guess. It's integrated with a text editor, so there's no need to stop writing to go to a web browser to open another window. And the collocation suggestions are easy to find, but only showed on demand. So there's no pop-ups. The writing process is not disrupted. So it's based on some of the tenets of data-driven learning. Suggestions are shown but not explained. Um, the idea is that by reflecting on the suggestions, the learner will note, the, the user will notice patterns in language. And as you know, the noticing hypothesis, noticing is a really important process in language learning. Meta-language is kept to a minimum. I think this is important because we're, we're linguists and perhaps sometimes we overestimate how much uh, linguistic or formal linguistic knowledge academics working in other fields have. You'd be surprised how many people couldn't tell you what a noun, what a noun is, what a verb is, what basic parts of speech are. 
And the lexical data it contains uh, is curated so that users don't get distracted by irrelevant or misleading information or an overload of information. And I will talk about information overload a little further on in the presentation. So what does Collocate look like? How does it work? Well, um, it's a basic, it looks like a basic text editor. It works online, which is advantageous. So because no installation is needed, you don't need to install any programs. It's compatible with multiple devices and operating systems. Texts are private, we don't store or see them. So the user um, types the key, types, starts typing in the text editor. And if uh, a word they type is in our database, it's underlined. They can then click on a context menu. And here you can see some placeholders. Take advantage represents um, verbs with advantage, the node word as collocate. Selective advantage represents adjectives which qualify advantage. And here we've got prepositions and some common collocates of the preposition. So advantage of a method, advantage of approach, advantage over instruments, time, rivals, etc. So going down a further level, let's say, for example, we're interested in, in, in adjectives. We get, initially we get eight, eight options. Now these are sorted to the, uh, by the strength of so their association scores. So in the corpora, we examined selective advantage was the um, strongest adjective um, noun collocation we found with advantage and so say, for example, you're writing and you find something that suits what you want to say, you can go down a further level and see three examples taken from, adapted from genuine academic texts of this wording, of the wording use. At any of these steps, in any of these menus, if you double click, you can insert, um, you can insert this into your text directly without having to type everything out. We also give, we only display initially the first eight uh, collocations, but we give the user options of finding more if they want, and we display them in a in a in a sidebar uh, with links to external resources. So, how did we get here? How did we develop this tool? Well, our starting point was that it's individual words, not collocations, that learners uh, that users look for. Writers aren't going to think, "Where in my text can I fit the collocation conduct research?" they're more likely to think about what words can I use with research. And because we only initially had 36 months, we thought we could deal with around 500 uh, nodes. And we thought that these should be maximum, maximally useful to academic writers across the disciplines. So we took three sources to, to, uh, to obtain this list of nodes. Um, the first is a subsection of the academic vocabulary list, which occurs across disciplines in the, the British Academic Written English corpus. So this is a corpus of essays by students at university. So this list represents the kind of lexis that students need to use. So the kind of words they write and by extension, uh, the kind of collocations they write. Then the academic collocations list and we also looked at the academic keyword list uh, by Magali Paco. So how did we, how once we had our nodes, how did we get our collocates? Well, we use Sketch Engine, um, particularly we use the word sketch tools. I, I don't know if, um, I'm sure most people here have used Sketch Engine or and the word sketch, but I'll just quickly go through it. Um, so each of these tables represents a collocational pal paradigm. Um, quali here, for example, we have um, adjective mo or modifiers of research. Here we have um, verbs that take research as an object, and here we have verbs that take research as a subject. This figure in the middle column here um, is the co-occurrence figure, the number of times, for example, here, qualitative research, 
qualitative and research occur together. And this figure here is the log dice statistic. So it's a statistical measure of association between node and collocates. Really anything above seven is a really strong collocation. So these tables go on and on for pages and pages, and we had limited time, limited resources. So we just, it would be really a waste of time to try and um, include everything. So we set some thresholds uh, after consulting with uh, EAP teachers, uh, looking at their own experience. We set a log die threshold, so an association score threshold of greater to or equal to five, and a co-occurrence threshold of 10 for lexical collocates. So in order to be considered for inclusion in our database, it had to occur 10 times uh, across disciplines in broad disciplinary areas, and 100 for prepositions. Uh, we ignored collocates that were too general. So for example, more research, much research. Um, there's no point in including these in the tool and, and them taking up valuable real estate. Writers already know how to use these. We also ignored discipline specific collocates, for example, market research here and marketing research. So we found, I've talked about nodes, I've talked about how we found collocates now. What about examples? Well, expert uh, examples were selected from corpora of expert academic writing. We worked from word sketch to concordance. So by clicking on the word sketch uh, in sketch engine, you're taken to um, a list of concordance lines of keywords and context lines. There was editorial intervention. This is key. This is key to our philosophy. We selected, we adapted, we anonymized, we shortened. And we made sure that they were words that occurred across, that were used across disciplines. Um, we were careful to select examples that promoted data-driven learning. Uh, three examples, well, Anna's found that there's not much to be gained from including more than three examples. Three examples is the optimum um, number for written production. Uh, if possible, we used, we included colligation clues. So for example, here with the, with the verb accept, you'll notice that, um, widely accepted um, is the is the um, is the most common let's say construction and we made sure our we made sure that the examples we include reflected this uh, we made sure to that the examples were brief they were less so they took less effort to process so they were less distracting for writers and in the end at the end of this process we had um, 561 academic lemmas, which um, mapped to three, around, around 32,000 uh, collocation suggestions, around 9,500 of which we give full examples for. And these are really carefully curated corpus examples. And in total, there are around 28,500 examples. So what did we learn along the way? Well, two broad lessons I'd like to highlight today. And the first is that e-lexicographic methods have their limits and must be used with, uh, with our critical faculties, if you will. So to, to illustrate this, I'm gonna talk about some node selection issues, some collocation selection issues, and some example selection issues. We recently um, published an article about this in the IGL. But full disclosure, some of the slides um, I'm going to show today we used at, in our presentation at ELEX, at the last ELEX conference. So if you were there, uh, apologies. Um, the second lesson is that concepts from HCI can be used to help lexicographers and language users. I'm going to talk about work in memory constraints, some of the usability measures from HCI we use to evaluate the tool and mental model confusion. I'll also talk very briefly about the aesthetic usability effect. And again, um, I gave a, pres a workshop presentation about this uh, at the last ELEX. So node selection issues. We noticed there was considerable variation between word lists, between the three word lists, which all 
purport to represent academic language. We found that basic lemmas with major academic meanings were missing from well-known academic word lists. So table it was only in one of the word lists, field wasn't in any step paper. You probably, under, if some of you probably worked out why these aren't included. Lemmas less central appeared to be overrated in comparison. For example, application code. Why are these there and saying important academic words like paper not? So this is all to do with sense distinctions. Word lists use disregard sense, dis sense distinctions. No sense, they're not sensitive to academic senses of lemmas widely used in general language. So they use the, the PACO word list, for example, uses keyword methodology. Uh, so for example, when we have words like table, which have the sense in academic language of a means of organizing data, but also a very general sense of a piece of furniture or field, which is broadly synonymous to discipline, but has a very general sense of farmer's field or football field, step, uh, part of a process in academic English, uh, if, you, if we're writing about methodology, but part of a process in walking too, and paper where it has a multitude of everyday uses from a physical material to a newspaper, um, but also we have in academic English conference paper. Um, it's really, so these really important academic senses get diluted in a way by these general senses. And then the word lists which have used the keyword methodology, ignore them. So ideally what we decided to do in practical terms was just include, include these uh, obvious missing academic words. So why did the less central lemma seem overrated in comparison? Well, here's two telling examples. The first application is used um, with, in many different senses, but across lots of disciplines. So a request, for example, uh, a, se a successful patent application, software in IT, um, use, the use of statistics is the application of statistics. Then we have not interdisciplinary, but multidisciplinary words like code, which is used in computing machine code, for example. In biology, we talk about uh, genetic code. In language and linguistics, we talk about code when we're talking about different codes, different languages. Um, so this meant that all these lemmas with the distinct senses, which the methods used to um, to compile the word, the word list don't account for, jump the rank queue. I like to think of these as lots of different words put in on a coat and going on, standing on each other's uh, shoulders and pretending that they're all one big word. Uh, I don't know if that's a really confusing metaphor, sorry. Uh, another issue was word class. So this came out in an um, evaluation workshop we did in Leon. Uh, and one of the users was really worried that her word aim was not in, her word aim as a noun was not in the tool. So some homographs are naturally more frequent in one class than others. So for example, aim here is much more free, aim as a noun here is much more frequent than aim as a verb, the same benefit, the same projective. But this can give the impression that lexical coverage is inconsistent and indeed this is something that came out in our user testing. So what we did in these cases, we just um, we just included the homographic counterpart, even if they did not meet our initial thresholds. Now I'm gonna move on to some issues we noticed when researching collocations. So once we'd got our nodes, we, decided we had to look for collocations and these are some of the issues we came up against. So this word sketch shows uh, verbs used with research as an object in the PKI corpus, that's the Pearson International Corpus of Academic English. Is there anything missing? You probably guessed it, it's carry out research. And if you look in a window of five words to either side of the, of the node word, then um, 
you'll notice that there are 303 um, occurrences of this collocation. So I'm, I haven't worked out the log dice score, but I'm guessing it would be above, up here above, uh, cond uh, above conduct. So this is this perennial problem in NLP, something that's plagued uh, computer programmers and linguists for years, and cor corpus linguists for years and years, how to deal with spaces. So basically we found that word sketches don't really deal with phrasal verbs. Another problem is that word sketches sort collocates according to word class. This is great most occasions, but collocation paradigms don't always mesh to a single word class. So for example, take these four sentences. We've got an argument about a film and a dream, an argument over film and dream. Okay, these are both about and over, both prepositions, no problem. The argument concerning film and dream, the argument regarding film and dream, um, this is slightly different. These aren't prepositions, these are verbs, but functionally, functionally they're acting like prepositions so what we decided to do was to move them in our tool and treat them as prepositions because functionally that's the role they're playing another important point is that um rela governance relations uh, are sometimes are sometimes uh, distorted or missed by sketch grammars. So compare these two sentences. Um, it's clear here that attitude governs too, but here in the second sentence, well, it's not attitude that's governing too, it's in fact convey. The same here, uh, communities develop no problem, but here develops, is uh, community is not the subject of develop in fact it's the object in fact connectedness is the subject of develop so these similar these sentences which are similar on surface but different um will have different grammar relations really confuse computers i mean this is kind of obvious to a human analysis but um but this escapes the, the sketch grammar. So of the, a consequence of this was uh, inflating and distorting the log die and um, co-occurrence figures. A similar problem, but this time with semantics, clearly the late development of passives and the latest technological developments in the field, same kind of surface meaning, but completely different, well, very different semantics. An increased demand and increasing energy demands similar on surface but semantically very different this also of course this affects the log die and co-occurrence statistics and poly so these these kind of polysemous collocates get bumped up the queue to select our examples i'll turn now to some very briefly to some example selection issues we use the good x um, tool which attempts to select good dictionary, um, good corpus lines, good candidates for examples in dictionaries by taking things like anaphora, length, vocab into account. And really, this is it's really helpful a lot of the time. It really narrows down the number of corpus lines you've got to sift through to get to get a nice candidate for an example. However, for the, in this case of undertake and in lots of cases like it the most common construction was activities undertaken so this is a, a passive form with the with the b is elided um with how it, so and this was by far the most common most common colligation right but the examples given precedence by good x ignore this completely However, if we turn good X off, well, again, most of the examples just randomly selected, in fact, do uh, do reflect this colligation. So that's something to be aware of. So why is this important? This may seem obvious to trained linguists. I'm sure you're thinking, well, lots of these things are very obvious, but 
have to bear in mind that many dictionaries, many lexical resources uh, are increasingly made using automa automatic or algorithmic techniques, which would have missed these issues. And this information we know from our user studies is very important for users. So I'm going to turn my attention now to some of the lessons we learned from uh, applying techniques from human computer interaction studies to lexicography. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is Fitt's law. And Fitt's law states that the time to acquire a target is the function of a distance to and the size of a target. So this basically means that if you've got things you need a user to click on, make them big and put them close to each other. So in terms of resources dealing with collocations, display collocates near the node. Traditionally, dictionaries haven't done this very well. Um, the user has to cover a large distance to, to find a collocate. So you've got, first you've got to search, then you've got to click here, then you've got to scroll down all of this until, until you finally find this section on collocations. So in collocate, um, it's not a particular, this isn't a particularly innovative solution. We do have other ways of visualizing the information, but, but a good old fashioned context menu has many advantages here because the collocation is really close to the node. The user doesn't have to move the mouse much. Everything is, there's not much interaction cost. We also, thought about working memory and it's often said that the average person can only keep seven plus or minus two items in working memory this has been latterly revised to four with an emphasis with an emphasis on grouping things together so in cognitively demanding tasks such as reading and writing it's really important to inspect to respect these limitations so if you look at language tools like the thesaurus in microsoft word in the context menu you'll notice that there are never more than eight options. And the idea being that we process these in two groups of four. This is something we followed in Collocate. We initially only show the user eight suggestions because in 80% of the circumstances, this is, probably, this is probably gonna satisfy the user's needs. Um, also remember, these aren't sorted alphabetically. These are sorted by strength of association score. So moving on now to some of the usability measures we use to evaluate the tool. Uh, we use the system usability scale, which is described as a quick and dirty tool for measuring the usability of systems. It's been used with everything from web pages to, I don't know, space shuttles. And I'm, I'm not even joking, with microwaves in between. It's a standard in usability testing. It's referenced in over 1,300 publications. And that, that was some years ago, so it's probably it's probably much more much more cited now it's quick and cheap to administer it's reliable even with small sample sizes and in so much that it measures what it claims to it's valid it's just a it's basically a 10 item Likert scale with uh, alternating positive and negative questions really easy to interpret as well so basically anything over 52 or so and you've got a usable tool so we use this uh, we use this this scale to evaluate three early prototype versions of our of our tool uh, in Poland, in in Paris, in Brazil, and in Leon. And as you can see, um, the the results were encouraging. We were tending towards an excellent degree of usability. So we were quite happy with that. Um, However, the SUS, the, the usability scale is non-diagnostic. It can tell you how usable a resource is, but not, where, not what is wrong with the tool, with the, what needs to be improved. So it must be complemented with some questionnaires and observation. So when we came to evaluate the questionnaires and, and evaluate our observations from our, our usability workshops, um, there were some concepts from HCI that I thought were quite useful. The first of these is a mental model confusion. So in design, a mental model comprises what a user believes about a system. So the common problems we see are a gap between a designer's mental model and a user's mental model. 
So users confuse, often confuse different parts of a system. So for example, um, confu this used to happen. It doesn't happen anymore because, uh, because uh, designers realized that people were doing this. People would try and search in the address bar of a web browser and it would break, it wouldn't work. In lexicography, uh, an example of mental model confusion is that uh, lexicographers and users often differ on headwords. So for example, the, the refrain, a stitch in time saves nine. The lexicographer might be thinking, oh, they'll definitely look up stitch. I'll, I'll list it under stitch. Whereas the user might be thinking, should I look up time? Well, in e-lexicography, there, there's some solutions to this problem. Another example from Macmillan, if you search for time nine, save nine, time save, it brings up the, all of these combinations bring up the phrase, which is kind of helpful. So the mental model confusion we observe in Collocate is that some users assume that all the underlined words in their text were errors. They confused it with a spell checker or a grammar checker. And remember, we're not offering a corrective model of feedback, but just suggestive feedback, not corrections, but suggestions for improvement. So users would see all these words underlined and think, oh, my text is terrible. Um, so how did we how did we combat this? Well, this was this is not so easy to combat. It's really it's really difficult to change people's learned behavior. But something uh, that did seem to have an effect was changing the underlying color to green. I mean, green is associated with good, with uh, with traffic lights. Green for go, red for stop, red for danger. So this seems to have helped a little bit. Uh, one final thing, and it's a seems like an obvious point, and but designers call this the aesthetic usability effect. And it's the idea that users often perceive aesthetically pleasing design as design that is more usable. So on our earlier versions, which perhaps weren't the prettiest looking versions, lots of users commented on design of the page. And I basically bring this up because there's so many great dictionaries and resources out there that has got so much great data in them. There's so much hard work behind them and that you go to access them and the web page looks horrible. I just think this should really be um, a more important consideration. Okay, so um, moving on to the impact and opportunities uh, from Collocade. What's Collocade achieved and where do we go from here? Well, we have over 4,200 registered users as of this morning. And we haven't really done any advertising. We've given quite a few talks at conferences, but that's the extent of it. Most of it's been word of mouth. Somehow we got onto Chinese TikTok. I don't know how that, how that happened. Most users um, intend to use the tool for writing and revising text when they sign up. Around 300 or so users uh, specifically using it for teaching. We know that some people are using it, using it in their in their classes because uh, we've seen referrals from uh, academic from university websites. Um, most of our users are PhD students. Or, uh, most of our users are postgraduate students. Um, we do have quite a few lecturers and professors and researchers interested. As for the dominant writing language of the people who signed up, well, Chinese is by far and away the, the largest user group. I mean, there are a lot of, there's a huge population to potential of potential users there. So that, that's a possible explanation. Portuguese, uh, because Anna, the, the, principal investigator is Portuguese and we did it, we've done a lot of testing in Brazil. And again, that's a very large population. So the more tangible things, well, we've got a lexical database, which as I said, is quite extensive. It's available on request for research purposes and it's gonna be licensable for commercial purposes. We recently published a sample, if you're interested, just I wanna have a look. 
here's the reference. The same goes for the source code. This uh, we recently released the source code, which uh, allows users to recreate the Collocade interface to visualize other data. Uh, this could be used for by, for creating resources for similar for other languages. For example, if you had a database of Spanish or Catalan nodes and collocates lying about, you could just plug it into the Collocade database. It could also be used for developing um, a resource for more specialized Lexis. So less tangible lessons learned. Well, there are limits to the automatic of lexicography, at least with current technology. Um, human input is really, really needed. Concepts and techniques from human-computer interaction research are really useful for lexicographers, not only in compiling uh, lexicographic data, but also visualizing the data and evaluating resources. So opportunities for further research. Um, We'd like to further experiment with the application of HCI techniques to lexicography. I'll be presenting a paper at ELEX about this using another type of test. We'd like to do some more testing with, with users and we'd, uh, we'd be really interested if other people oh, want to develop versions for other, other languages and other specific purposes. Um, the database provides a really good platform from which to conduct contrastive studies of collocations. We have a paper examining um, the collocation issues in second language uh, English writing by researchers in Brazil. So saying which collocations they tend to overuse and, and examining why that might be. Um, you can try Collocade, it's completely free uh, on, at collocade.uk. You have to sign up, but it's a really short sign up process. Um, incidentally, this is, this, is what the, this is what the interface looks like. It's really simple, it's a, it's, a web, it's a web based interface. We have, apart from this context menu view, we have, uh, tree view as well. So some other ways of visualizing collocations. Um, I don't think I have anything more to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you're interested in the references from the talk, well, I have them all here. I'm very happy to give you copies of the slides. I'm very happy if there are any questions, if anyone's got any comments, I'd, I'd be delighted. Thank you, Garen. I, I was, I, I thought this was a really interesting presentation and I'm fascinated by the idea that you made it to TikTok <laughs> and by this user saying that their text was terrible. I think that's so sad that they thought that and that you implemented these changes in the color. So I mean, it, it wasn't only to do with that, but that was, that was part of it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anyone wants to ask questions to Gerent? Yeah, Geoffrey Williams. Um, your microphone is muted. I think you need to unmute it. Yeah. I cannot hear you. Can you hear him? No. No, no. No, but we could hear you before, so perhaps. Or in the chat, perhaps? Yeah, that's another option. If you want to write on the chat, I can... Well, we have Mercedes comments as well, so... <laughs> in the oh, meantime. You're very welcome, thank you. It's, it's, a, it's my pleasure, really. Any better? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, perfect. Loud and clear now, Jeffrey. We can hear you. Ah, but now he can't hear us. Oh dear.
You can hear me. I yeah. can hear you now, yes. Yes. Okay, because I can't hear a thing. Oh. Um, <laughs> so, um, what I was going to say is that I, I'm always very bothered by the mania of e-lexicography to confuse knowledge in terms of data and wisdom in terms of brain. Dictionaries require wisdom. And until the elex people understand that you can't just put the whole caboodle through a machine and spit out rubbish in, rubbish out, we won't get anywhere. However, that's just a personal thing. What I was going to ask you is, uh, or whether you'd looked at terminology variation, which can find some of the weirdies on uh, more complex collocations. A lot of work done by Beatrice Dye and Mary Claude Lum on that. And another thing I was going to say, uh, but I can get back to you on that, I'm working with a publisher who is specialized in dyslexia, and their use of a web screen is very interesting. Um, it's going to be, I don't think you can hear me, no? So this is going to be a strange answer. But uh, no, well, we, we didn't use the, we didn't use the terminology extraction work. I am aware of it, but we didn't use it. And mainly because it's this, it's this difficult question of how specific to focus things on. Um, I think we we could have built a tool where we focused on specific purpose, uh, specific purpose language, or really specific academic disciplines. Uh, he can, if he's really interested, he can watch this after. No, he can watch the recording. Okay, yeah. Uh, so we could have built a tool where we um, where we looked at specific purpose languages, uh, but we really wanted to address a, what, as wide an audience as possible. Um, so we decided in the end to focus on general uh, academic English to the, to the extent to which that exists. Uh, another consideration, and I think it's one, uh, a point you've made to me before, Jeffrey, is that people who are experts in their fields already know the, the terminal, terminological collocations from their fields. It's the more general ones which lie between general language and really specialized language that cause that tend to cause them problems. Uh, if there, are there any other questions? Yeah. And it's up. Thank you oh. very much for the talk. Lo les o te lo leo yo, Gerent, por si hay alguien que no vea el chat o algo así. Uh, I mean, I, I could read it. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, a, a good question. If you're planning to launch the version supporting the languages of Spain, well, we don't, we don't have, we don't plan to develop a version uh, in other languages. But as I say, we've made, uh, we've made the source code available uh, and we've made the, our data model available. So if anybody really wants to, if anybody really wants to to do that, well, we'd be. I, th I think I can't. I'm I'm sure Anna feels the same, but uh, we'd we'd be really supportive of that. We'd we'd really like to see somebody else do that. Uh, I think. Janet, Sergi, han levantado la mano. No sé. Janet, te has escrito por aquí. Tú mismo. No importa el orden, yo creo. Creo que ha sido a la vez, más o menos. No me he dado cuenta de quién la ha levantado antes. Dan el mismo que ha escrito. Sergi, prime. Ah, vale, pues Sergi. Pues vale, gracias. Um, I, I will try to, to ask my question in English, but if I'm not able, I will switch to Spanish. Um, all the examples you, uh, do you, uh, you, you had uh, was examples uh, in which the, call, the, the term you look at for was a noun or a verb, a verb, but just uh, just having collocations with adverbs, not with adjectives, not uh, adjective or adverbs, uh, verbs with nouns. No, no, no. I, I, in fact, we deal with. Uh, we've got noun bases. We've got adjective bases. 
We've, okay. And we've got a verb basis. Verbs collocate with uh, adverbs. I think in the examples, I, sh I, sh well, I should have included and this. You as... have verbs with noun, for example, or yeah. adjectives with noun. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and so adjectives you, with noun. You don't have a, a, um, a conception of collocation with directionality as Melchow or something like that. Yeah, no, no, we do. We do. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. Oh, well, you mean so to say which which is the like in in the in the Melchuk sense? No, we don't. Okay. So that means which is which one is governing the other one? No, in mm -hmm. no, in that in that sense, no. Thanks. Janet. Thank you, Garrett. I have two questions. The first one is. After having worked on this project, has your view of academic word lists like that of Coxhead, which I think is probably the most commonly refer the most commonly used academic word list? You know my view, which is basically negative of the academic word list or the usefulness of the academic word list. But I was wondering, after having worked on this now for some years if if your view has changed uh, that's the first question but you I don't, maybe you want to answer that one first this is the other questions is pretty different uh, so to an extent I mean I sometimes get the suspicion and this is a personal opinion I I sometimes have the suspicion that these word lists are not really um, made out of a desire to, or out of a desire to help students. So that's not the the first thing. Just because, but they're just done because the technology is there. Right. But I understand that no word list can be perfect. Um, I think in the twenty years since Cox said, there's been, I mean, some great advances. But uh, the the missing the missing nodes, I mean, uh, from words, and they really are very important words in academia, paper, for example, uh, table, oh, the, these missing words, I, I would have thought that if you just reflected on your word list with a critical eye, you would have, you would have noticed that these weren't there. No, oh, yeah. Uh, well, you know my opinion about, about, Coxhead's academic word list. So it's uh, mm -hmm. that's. Uh, I was just wondering if, if yours view had changed. The second question I had is uh, so much of the work on collocations has been a result and sort of a conjoinder to work on learners' lexicography. So as you were giving your talk, I, I, I well, sort of for obvious reasons, I don't go to learners' dictionaries of English myself very often. I go there when I want to see what my students are going to look for, and I tell my students to go there. But I always look at either Merriam-Webster or American Heritage first. And in fact, I just looked while you were talking, I looked up paper, steps, and table, and all three include, uh, both of those dictionaries include senses that would fit into the academic use of paper. They even rarely for a, a, a native speaker dictionary, but they give an example for paper mm -hmm. and they say scholarly paper. So I wonder if sort of going to what Jeffrey said, clearly American, neither American Heritage nor Merriam-Webster are corpus based. They, they're dictionaries that have been in existence for a long enough time that they were based on citations and they were based on people reading. Mm -hmm. And if in the uh, sort of the modernization of the dictionary production process, we may have lost some of the fine tooth sense distinction and paid so much attention to frequency in general, I don't know, in general discourse that we may have missed information that in fact was there. I mean, I, I, I didn't look historically to what 
what edition of Merriam-Webster's started with scholarly paper, but I, I would have to think that probably is from the beginning of the 20th century. It's probably, oh, that sense is probably over a hundred years old in the dictionary with mm -hmm. the same example. So isn't part of the problem what has sort of the way learner's dictionaries have developed? They think they can cover all these collocations, but they don't, or? I mean, you would, I think in, a learner's dictionary, you would probably find this. You would probably find these senses. Uh, I, um, I understand. I think I, under, I agree with the sentiment, and that is that um, we should be perhaps a little more critical or or reflective about the way uh, about this rush to to corpora and disregarding what's come before. Um, I think that's true, but. These academic senses are in learner's dictionaries. Uh, they're just not in the academic word list. So this makes me think that when people are creating these learner's dictionaries, they are doing a little bit of reflection on on the on the head word list. They are thinking, oh, what's missing here? So perhaps this is happening, yes. Just one last thing. I I'm so glad that you mentioned the lack of of good visualization of many products because of I, I personally hate the way you look at coca now. I, I, I sort of feel like I, I need to grab the table and hold on to myself. Am I going to be angry at yeah. <laughs> at them for doing this? But I have the same reaction, for example, when I look at FrameNet. And I think, how could something as brilliant as the idea of FrameNet and is something that that you see these people have done so much work look as bad mm -hmm. as this? Um, <laughs> because I think it looks terrible. And I think it the way it looks makes it much less useful. Mm -hmm. And so that I think that's something that that really needs to be when people in lexicography uh, Always now a very common complaint is that Google does everything, so people in lexicography aren't needed anymore. But Google doesn't do anything for visualization. That's something that lexicographers who presumably know more about what they want to show could at least have some sort of joint project with people who know how to do this better. Yeah, I. I I, I agree. I agree with you. Uh, the this is the in fact the improved version of Coca. This is the redesigned one and supposedly better version. But it it's it's really tricky to use. Um, but there are in other cases, for example, in Scale. I think this is a this is a, re a really nice design. It's really easy to use. Very intuitive. But the problem is when 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 one is writing the 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 fact that you have to stop what you're doing, open open a browser window, get distracted by all of these adverts, which there's there's a couple of studies on this that show that these are really, really distracting. Uh, that's something to be considered as well. So I think I think personally I think the future is in really close closer integration. Perhaps we won't even be talking about separate dictionaries apart from for historical lexicography and and academic studies i think we're going to have kind of a ubiquitous lexicography like now we have computing built into everything we're going to have dictionaries and lexicography uh, lexicography seamlessly built into everything that's that's, well, that's my thought anyway thanks for the question any further questions? Sergi, your hand is up. Okay. Do you still want to ask a question? Sergi? No. Okay. Uh, anyone else? No? Oh. Then, well, yeah. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to well, thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I, I hope it was clear. Uh, if really, really, if you do get a chance to I'd really encourage you all to sign up and play around with the tool. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot.
I was also wondering about the accessibility of this tool, Garen, but perhaps this is something that we can discuss uh, at yeah. a later time. But I think apart from UX design and all of these things that you've mentioned about vi visualization, I think it would be great to make this tool accessible for persons with sight disability, for example, mm -hmm. and so on. So I, I will have a look at that. Oh, that well. would be cool. All right, great. Excellent. Thank you, Thank Thank you so very much, much everyone. Uh, so I think we can leave it here. Thank you all. Our next seminar will be on the 3rd of May and it will be uh, led by Janet Decessoris here. So you will be uh, told about everything about it in an email, I don't know, at some point next week, for example, or something like that. Hopefully by the end of this, week. I need to practice, but it'll be by the end of this week. Okay. So thank you all and well, see you soon. Bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Lovely to see you all.